<laughs> oh, oh, hi, I didn't see you there. Um, Miss Sam told me to be stopping by. Go ahead, take a seat. Um, so I'm Mr. Gold. I'm one of Miss Moskovitz's uh, lovely co-workers at Mainland High School. And, uh, she said you guys had some questions about 1896. So, uh, I'm here to explain. But first, um... I always like to say history doesn't exist in a vacuum, so in order to understand our good friend William Jennings Bryan, or uh, that darling William McKinley, or the election of 1896, there's some things we have to understand first, and I'd like to start by talking about this thing called the gold standard. So, um, you may have heard Miss Moskowitz say this before, and I'm kind of of an agreeance that economics is essentially fake, but, <laughs> but what the gold standard was, was... Um, right before the turn of the century, basically everywhere in the world, not just America, all currency was tied to gold, because gold had an inherent value, right? So basically, essentially, and this is really simplifying the point, you could take a dollar to the American treasury and trade it for an equal value of gold. And that's all well and good. Gold has an inherent value, so it's going to add inherent value to your currency. The only problem is gold's expensive, and it's finite. There's a limited amount. So, if you are, say, working class and need a loan, or say you're a farmer that has a uh, debt, um, that debt's going to be really hard to make up because gold is very expensive. Um, and this was the case for a lot of Western farmers in America around the turn of the century. So, those Western farmers advocated for a thing called free silver. What free silver was, was adding silver coinage to the gold standard. Why silver? Well, there's more of it. It's less expensive. So you can see that it's going to... If you add silver into the economy, uh, it's going to make things a little bit easier for farmers. It became one of the rallying cries for uh, a new political movement called the Populist Party. Um, the Populist Party kind of latched on to the progressive movement at the end of the 19th century. You know, your Upton Sinclairs, your Thomas Nass, your Jane Addams of the world. So to appeal to farmers, in 1890, the American government passed this thing called the Sherman Silver Purchase Act. Now, the Sherman Silver Purchase Act did not give free silver. What it did, though, was that it allowed for coinage of silver. So silver was going to enter the American economy, right? Here's the problem. You know, and I know, Silver isn't as good as gold, or rather, it isn't as expensive. But part of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act was that silver could be traded to the government for basically bonds, like coin tickets. I'll put it that way. But those could be traded back to the government for either silver or gold. Okay, so I imagine now you're understanding the problem here. I drew a little diagram. Okay, so basically what investors would do is this. They would go and buy a bunch of silver. They would sell that silver to the government. The government was required to purchase 4.5 million ounces of silver a month, if I remember correctly. And then they'd get those coin tickets, right? The investor which they could trade for gold or silver. So they turn around and get gold, a bunch of gold, which they would then use to buy more silver and repeat the process over. As you can see, uh, for your smart investor, this basically led to an unlimited amount of money. But the problem was, as we've previously kind of got on about, um. There was a finite amount of gold, especially in the American treasury. So, when people realize this and they start to panic, 
bad things happen to the economy. And this leads us to the Panic of 1893. So the Panic of 1893 was essentially the Great Depression before the Great Depression, right? Uh, the peop the historians or the, uh, the uh, uh, journalists of the 1890s didn't know the Great Depression was happening, of course. So uh, at this point in time, it was the Great Depression. It was the worst economic catastrophe in the United States. Um, history up to that point reached about 20% unemployment. And this occurred because when people started to get wise to the gold issue, some banks started to default. And when the banks started to default, investors that had a lot of money immediately went and tried to liquefy their investments. To liquefy means to like cash out, basically. And when they cashed out, they went to the treasury and tried to get it for gold. So there was a huge run on gold on the American treasury. Grover Cleveland, the president at the time, let me see if I can get a picture of good old Grover. Here he is right here. Everyone say hi to Grover. Well, he can't hear you uh, because you're through the camera. And also, I don't know if you can see him very well. Kind of got that low resolution. Suffice it to say, Grover Cleveland realizes very quickly that uh, the United States is about to go insolvent. Um, we're basically gonna get the car repoed, you know? And Grover Cleveland was a Democrat. He was supposed to be on the side of the more progressive element of the politics of the United States at the time. But he ends up having this backdoor meeting. Like, this secret, undercover of darkness meeting with one of the wealthiest men in the country, J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan, the individual seen by a lot of progressives as a robber baron, one of these underhanded one percenters that had gotten their wealth by ill-gotten gains and lorded it over the working class. J.P. Morgan has this meeting with Grover Cleveland, and he says, listen, Grover, buddy, the jig is up. You guys are out of money, and I'm going to help you. So basically, J.P. Morgan loans the federal government, a ton of gold. He and a bunch of investors agreed to give the federal government a ton of gold in exchange for federal bonds that are sold privately. And when this comes out, it's a huge scandal. It was completely legal. There was a tiny law that was written during the Civil War that basically was like a loophole that made it legal. But it was a huge scandal. It was clear Grover Cleveland was on thin ice, politically. And then the Pullman strike happens. If you recall, I'm sure Miss M covered it in class, the Pullman strike was a strike based around workers that were working for George Pullman at the Pullman Car Company. Uh, he owned the company town of Pullman outside of Chicago. And when the panic of... I'm probably going to give up on the pictures, guys. Honestly, I don't think you can see them. During the panic of 1893, George Pullman cut 20% of his labor force, and the remaining people were cut 20% of their earnings. So you've got to consider, many of these people are living in a company town like Pullman, so their rent goes to Pullman, um, their kids go to schools that are funded by Pullman. So if you lose your job, you're getting evicted, your kids are getting, you are losing their school, you lose your community, all of that. And if your uh, wages are cut, if everything stays the same in terms of cost, there's no way that you can survive. So the Pullman workers go on strike, and they end up being supported by the American Federal Rail Workers Union that's led by Eugene Debs, who um, you might remember... Uh, later in life will run as the Socialist Party of America's candidate for president. So Eugene Debs gets that union involved and 100,000 railroad workers go on strike because of the situation of Pullman and just because of the general economic panic at large. Um, basically, all railroads west of Chicago are shut down. And you got to think, most of the industry is shipping out west at this point in time. There's a lot of westward expansion still, even this late in the 19th century. So this puts 
America's internal economics at a standstill in a time of economic panic. Cleveland's response to this, uh, and this is the long and the short of it, I can go into the Pullman strike, but uh, that's a story for another day. Uh, the long and the short of it is Cleveland sends in the National Guard along with basically the entire police force of Chicago and the surrounding areas and breaks the strike. And when he breaks the strike, uh, several workers die. Uh, it's a scandal. And it becomes clear beyond anything that Grover Cleveland will not be renominated by the Democratic Party. So in 1896, we're going to have a new president. The question becomes, who is it going to be? Enter William Jennings Bryan. Now, William Jennings Bryan is a really interesting figure uh, for this point in American history. Uh, he's 36 at the time. He's been a short amount of time a congressman from the state of Nebraska, uh, which is essentially a backwater at this point in time. Uh, at least to us coastal elites out on the eastern seaboard. And he's a, a, a pretty gifted speaker. Uh, he comes from a church background, so uh, he was kind of trained in how to give speeches. And he sat on the Ways and Means Committee in Congress. So he was a little bit well-known, but when he threw his hat in the ring for the Democratic nominee for presidency, he was definitely considered a dark horse candidate, probably someone's fourth or fifth pick, right? But then comes the Democratic National Convention, and nobody knows who's going to be the nominee. There's all sorts of people vying for the spot. So you have this series of debates, and it goes on the first day, they can't pick anybody. The second day, they can't pick anybody. I mean, at this point, they can't even agree on the party platform. Are we going to go for free silver? Are we going to support going back to the gold standard like the Republicans want? What are we going to do? So there's a third day of debates, and they're still debating the party platform. And at this point in time, William Jennings Bryan steps out of the shadows, into the spotlight of history, and he gives arguably the greatest political speech of American history. Now, it's a nine-minute speech. I won't bore you with the whole thing, but if you will indulge me, I'd like to read you the ending. Now, mind you, this is a guy that not a lot of people know. He was a, a small-time congressman from a small state in terms of population. He's going to wow people, and this is how he does it. It is the issue of 1776 over again. Our ancestors, when but three million, had the courage to declare their political independence of every other nation upon earth. Shall we, their descendants, when we have grown to seventy million, declare that we are less independent than our forefathers? No. My friends, it will never be the judgment of this people. Therefore, we care not upon what lines the battle is fought. If they say bimetallism is good, two metals, gold and silver, if they say bimetallism is good, but we cannot have it till some nation helps us, we reply that instead of having a gold standard, because England has, we shall restore bimetallism, and then let England have bimetallism because the United States have. If they dare to come out in the open field and defend the gold standard as a good thing, we shall fight them to the uttermost, having behind us the producing masses of the nation and the world, having behind us the commercial interests and the laboring interests and all the toiling masses, we shall answer their demands for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns, you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. So, after this nine-minute oration, he ends it like that, and he basically lays down the law and says, look, all these people are saying the gold standard is good because Europe is doing it. Well, let's just do bimetallism because it's going to work for us. Let's not wait for them, and they can do it because we're doing it. And we want what the farmers want, we want the, what the workers want, and we're going to stand up and fight them out in the open. And you will not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. 
and he ends his speech, and he even, when he says cross of gold, he kind of throws his hands up as if to simulate the crucifixion. And there's silence. Absolute silence in the room. And um, Brian recalls going, wow, I must have screwed, uh, he, he thinks, oh, wow, I failed, I screwed up, I didn't, I, I'm, it must not have been that good of a speech. And as he starts to walk back to his seat, the crowd bursts. People throwing chairs, people yelling, hooting and hollering, stamping and clapping. Uh, delegates from different states, because if you if you know how um, the National Convention is set up, it's like Nebraska sits here and Illinois sits here and Florida sits here. Delegates from other states grab the flags of their state and go and run to place it next to Nebraska as if to say, we're standing behind Nebraska and their talisman, William Jennings Bryan. He's lifted on the shoulders of people and carried out of the room. Um, and it becomes clear at this point that the arguing over whether the Democrats are going to be for bimetal or against bimetal is over. And frankly, the argument over who is going to be their nominee for president is over. It is certainly going to be William Jennings Bryan. And the Cross of Gold speech is remembered as maybe one of the most fundamentally great speeches in the history of the United States, but also the talisman of this movement. The Republicans, on the other hand, as I previously stated, uh, decide that they're for the gold standard. They want to go back to the gold standard. And there's not a great debate over who the man is going to be to lead them. Uh, they decide on the first ballot, on the first day, it's going to be William McKinley. William McKinley, a former congressman from Ohio, who is the current governor of Ohio. Well-liked, well-received, by the establishment. Now, William McKinley's campaign was run by a man named Mark Hanna. Uh, and Mark Hanna was very, very well connected. Think of McKinley as the face of the operation, and think of Hanna as the guy in the back room getting the deals done. So this is how the election shakes out. William Jennings Bryan tours the entire country. He gets the populist party to support him. So the populists are going to support the Democrats in the election. And he gives an average of 20 speeches a day, going from town to town, stumping, pouring his heart out to people saying, I want to do this for you. We got to change. We're going to bring progressive ideas to the White House. McKinley stays in Ohio. Um, he invites small groups of people into his home to speak to him. Imagine, probably, if you're getting into the home of a presidential candidate, you're probably very wealthy. And Mark Hanna goes and meets in boardrooms and golf clubs across the country and speaks to the well-to-do about how well McKinley will treat you as president. So... To this point in time, the largest amount of money to ever go into a political campaign goes into the McKinley campaign. At this point in time in America, there's about 15 million prospective voters. It's said that Mark Hanna generated so much money that there were 17 pieces of propaganda or campaign literature for every single voter pro-McKinley in the country. Think about that. Everywhere you go in the town square, in your mailbox, at work, posted on the wall. There's something anti-Brian, pro-McKinley. It really changes the election. And I mean, uh, you, you are at a point where uh, campaign laws are a little fast and loose here. There are factory workers that get printed on their pay stubs, hey, if you don't vote for McKinley... The factory's probably going to close, so you should probably vote for McKinley. Even Grover Cleveland, uh, kind of ousted by the Democrats, says that uh, Brian is too radical, and he endorses McKinley as a solid money man. I believe that's the phrase that he uses. So, when you break down 1896, you see that uh, America has become very sectionalized once again. The West and the South disproportionately go for William Jennings Bryan, but that very 
populated eastern corridor in uh, the production belt of Ohio and Michigan, all of New England, New York, Pennsylvania, they go heavily, heavily for William McKinley. And William McKinley wins. But you have, in 1896, and with William Jennings Bryan, I think something that you guys can relate to in your own lived experience. Um, political ideas that were kind of seen as below the mainstream, but due to economic troubles, having a chance to seize power at the mainstream level, or at least speak to the nation at large at what... Uh, a government under their power might look like. This might be familiar to you from 2008. It might be familiar to you from this year. Um, but 1896 is something that's not necessarily talked about a lot, but I think it's an, it's very important for shaping American history as we see it today, whether it's progressive movements in politics or the amount of money in politics or just generally um, how we see America. Uh whether it's a land where, you know, um, the power of the people can champion ideas, or whether it's a place where uh, money corrupts. Or maybe it's a little bit of both. Um, but that's a story for another day. If you'll indulge me, one last thing before you go. I'd love to read you guys a poem by Vashel Lindsay. He was a great American poet. He wrote a poem about himself as, a, as a, a young man around your guys' age campaigning for William Jennings Bryan in 1896. Um, it's a great poem, and I'd love to read it to you. It's called Bryan, 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 Bryan. By the way, uh, if this kind of sounds like Dr. Seuss, it's because Vasha Lindsay was very influential to Theodore Geisel in terms of his writing. So it's a little long. Sit back. In a nation of 100 fine, mob-hearted, lynching, relenting, repenting millions, there are plenty of sweeping, swinging, stinging, gorgeous things to shout about and knock your old blue devils out. I brag and chant of Brian, 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 candidate for president who sketched a silver Zion, the one American poet who could sing outdoors. He brought in tides of wonder, of unprecedented splendor, wild roses from the plains that made hearts tender. All the funny circus silks of politics unfurled, Bartlett pairs of romance that were honey at the cores, and torchlights down the street to the end of the world. There were truths eternal in the gap and tittle-tattle. There were real heads broken in the fustain and the rattle. There were real lines drawn, not the silver and the gold, but Nebraska's cry went eastward against the dour and the old, the mean and the cold. It was 1896, and I was just 16, and Altgeld ruled in Springfield, Illinois, when there came from the sunset Nebraska's shout of joy, in the coat like a deacon in a black Stetson hat, he scourged the elephant plutocrats who barbed wire from the plat. The scales dropped from their mighty eyes, they saw the summer's noon, a tribe of wonders coming to a marching tune. On the Longhorns from Texas, the Jayhawks from Kansas, the plop-eyed Bungaroo and the giant Giascus, the Varmint, the Chipmunk, the Bugaboo, the Horned Toad, the Prairie Dog, and Ballyhoo, from all the newborn states a row, bidding the Eagles of the West fly on, bidding the Eagles of the West fly on, the Fawn, Prodactyl, and the Thingamajig, the Rackabore, the Helen Gun, the Wangdoodle, the Bat Fowl and Pig, the Coyote, the Wildcat, and Grizzly in a glow, in a miracle of health and speed, the whole breed abreast. They leaped the Mississippi, blue border of the West, from the Gulf to Canada, two thousand miles long, against the towns of Tubal Cain, ah, oh, sharp was their song, against the ways of Tubal Cain, too cunning, of course it skipped. As I was saying. Against the ways that Tubal came to cunning for the young, the longhorn calf, the buffalo, and wampus gave tongue. These creatures were defending things Mark Hanna never dreamed. The moods of very childhood that in desert dews gleamed, the gossamers and whimsies, the monkey shines and didos, rank and strange of the canyons and the range, the ultimate fantastics of the far western slope and of prairie schooner children, 
born beneath the stars, beneath falling snows, of the babies born at midnight in the sod huts of lost hope, with no physician there except a Kansas prayer, with the Indian raid a-howling through the air. And all of these in their helpless days, by the dour east oppressed, mean paternalism making their mistakes for them, crucifying half the west till the whole Atlantic coast seemed a giant spider's nest. And these children and their sons at last rode through the cactus, a cliff of mighty cowboys on the lope, with gun and rope, and all the way to frightened Maine the old east heard them call, and saw our Brian by a mile lead the wall of men, whirling flowers and beasts, the bard and the prophet of them all, prairie avenger, mountain lion, Brian, Brian, Brian. Brian, Brian, gigantic troubadour, speaking like a siege gun, smashing Plymouth Rock with his boulders from the west, and just a hundred miles behind, tornadoes piled across the sky, blotting out sun and moon and sun on high. Headlong, dazed and blinking in weird green light, the scalawags made moan, afraid to fight. When Brian came to Springfield, and Altgeld gave him greeting, Rochester was deserted, Divernon was deserted, Mechanicsburg, Riverton, Chicken Bristle, Cotton Hill, empty. All of Sangamon drove to the meeting, in silver-decked racing cart, buggy, buckboard, carry-all, carriage, phaeton, whatever would haul. And silver-decked farm wagons gritted, banged, and rolled, with the new tale of Brian by the iron tires told. The state house loomed afar, a speck, a hive, a football, a captive balloon, and the town was all one spreading wing of bunting, plumes, and sunshine. Every rag and flag at Brian Picture's soul, where the rigs and made a dusty mile jammed our streets at noon, and joined the wild parade against the power of gold. We roomed, we boys of high school, with mankind while Springfield gleamed silk-lined. Oh, Tom Dines and Art Fitzgerald and the gangs that they could get. I can hear them yelling yet, helping the incantation, defying aristocracy, with every bridle gone, ridding the world of the low-down mean, bidding the eagles of the West fly on. Bidding the eagles of the West fly on. We were bully, wild and woolly, never yet curried below the knees. We saw flowers in the air, fair as the Pleiades, bright as Orion, hopes of all mankind made rare, resistless, thrice refined. Oh, we bucks from every Springfield ward, colts of democracy, yet time winds out of chaos from the star fields of the Lord. The long parade rolled on. I stood by my best girl. She was a cool young citizen with wise and laughing eyes. With my necktie by my ear, I was stepping on my deer, but she kept like a pattern without a shaken curl. She wore in her hair a brave prairie rose. Her gold chums cut her, for that was not the pose. No Gibson girl would wear it in that fresh way, but we were fairy democrats, and that was our way. The earth rocked like the ocean, the sidewalk was a deck, the houses for the moment were lost in the wide wreck, and the bangs played strange and stranger music as they trailed along. Against the ways of Tubal Cain, ah, sharp was their song. The demons in the bricks, the demons in the grass, the demons in the bank vaults peered out to see us pass, and the angels in the trees, and the angels in the grass, and the angels in the flags peered out to see us pass. And the sidewalk was our chariot, and the flowers bloomed higher, and the streets turned to silver, and the grass turned to fire. And then it was but grass, and the town was there again, a place for women and for men. Then we stood where we could see every band and the speaker stand, and Brian took the platform, and he lifted his hand and cast a new spell. Progressive silence fell in Springfield and Illinois around the world. Then we would hear these glacial boulders across the prairie rolled. The people have a right to make their own mistakes. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. And everybody heard him in the streets and state house yard, and everybody heard him in Springfield, in Illinois, around and around and around the world, that danced upon its access and like a darling bronco world. July, August, suspense. Wall Street lost a sense. August, September, October, more suspense. And the whole east down like a wind-smashed fence. Then Hannah rose to the rescue. Hannah of Ohio, rallying the roller tops, rallying the bucket shops, threatening drought and death, promising manna, rallying the trusts against the bawling flannel mouth, invading miser cellars, tin cans, socks, melting down the rocks, pouring out the long green to a million workers, spawn to licks by the mountain load, to stop each new tornado and beat the cheapskate, blatherskite, populistic, anarchistic, deacon death. Desperado. Election night at midnight. Boy Brian's defeat. Defeat of Western Silver. Defeat of the Wheat. Victory of letter files and plutocrats and miles with dollar signs upon their coats. Diamond watch chains on their vests and spats on their feet. Victory of custodians Plymouth Rock and all that inbred land board stock. Victory of the neat. Defeat of the aspen groves of Colorado valleys, the blue bells of the Rockies, and blue bonnets of old Texas by the Pittsburgh alleys. Defeat of alfalfa and the mariposa lily. Defeat of the Pacific and the long Mississippi. Defeat of the young by the old and the silly. 
Defeat of tornadoes by the poison vat supreme. Defeat of my boyhood. Defeat of my dream. Where is McKinley, that respectable McKinley, the man without an angle or a tangle, who soothed down the city man and soothed down the farmer, the German, the Irish, the southerner, the northerner, who climbed every greasy pole and slipped through every crack, who soothed down the gambling hall, the barroom, the church, the devil vote, the angel vote, the neutral vote, the desperately wicked and their victims on the rack, the gold vote, the silver vote, the brass vote, the lead vote, every vote? Where is McKinley? Mark Hanna's McKinley, his slave, his echo, his suit of clothes, gone to join the shadows with the pomps of that time, the flames of that summer's prairie rose. Where is Cleveland, who the Democratic platform read from the party in a glorious hour, gone to join the shadows with Pitchfork Tillman and Sledgehammer Altgeld, who wrecked his power? Where is Hannah, that bulldog Hannah, low-browed Hannah, who st said stand pat? Gone to his place with old Pierpont Morgan, gone somewhere with Lean Rat Platt. Where is Roosevelt, the young dude cowboy who hated Brian that aped his way, gone to join the shadows with Mike Cromwell and tall King Saul till the judgment day? And where is Outgeld, brave as the truth, whose name the few still say with tears, gone to join the ironies with old John Brown, whose fame rings loud for a thousand years? Where is that Brian, that heaven born Brian? That Homer Bryan, who sang from the West, gone to join the shadows with Altgeld the Eagle, where the kings and the slaves and the troubadours rest. Have a great day, guys.